So, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank Pavel for inviting me here. It's really a big honor uh, to be here and to represent uh, uh, young uh, scientists in, in Czech Republic. I don't know whether I managed to deliver wonder such wonderful lectures as Christina and Elena, uh, because uh, my field is not so exciting, uh, probably, or it's exciting for me. Uh, we are going deeper and deeper into, into molecules, into molecule biology and into chemistry and so on. And today I will be talking about our research, uh, which is uh, focused on RNA. So I will start briefly uh, with central dogma of, of molecule biology. So as you all know, the genes are encoded in DNA in our cells, and uh, these genes are actually transcribed into the RNA and then into proteins. And there are not only one type of RNA, there are many. Starting from mRNA, which is actually coding, this is the RNA, which is bringing the information about the gene and which is then translated. There are also tRNA, ribosomal RNA, which are very well known and described, but there are many new types of RNAs. And we are all the time describing and, and, and discovering new types and new functions of RNAs. And with my lab, we are particularly interested in RNA modifications because we, belo we believe that the RNA modifications can somehow also contribute to the uh, big portfolio of RNA function within the cell. Uh, as you all know, probably the RNA is built from tr four main building blocks, blocks, adenine, cytidine, guanine, and uridine. And this is true also for, for the DNA, but with RNA it is much more complex. We know that there are nowadays more than 170 uh, modifications. And what you can imagine under the um, modifications are, for example, methylations on sugar, for example. This is the only uh, modification which you can find on rib both, well, actually, there was a phosphorylation recently published. Uh, this methoxylation is making RNA super stable, and some people even presume that uh, if the world really started from the RNA, this was the point between, between RNA and DNA, because RNA was not stable. Uh, RNA is a very ephemeric molecule. The methylation makes it super stable. And then the nature realized, maybe if I remove the hydroxyl, I can get DNA, and it will be more stable. And that's what happened, and that's why we have now uh, all our genes uh, written in DNA. And uh, you maybe know that we can nowadays isolate our DNA from mammoths from Siberia and still get the information, but the RNA is really not stable. Uh, the lifetime in bacteria is approximately in minutes and in human cells uh, in hours. But there are other modifications, there are modifications on uh, base part, and there are also modifications at the five prime end. And uh, this is what we are interested in the most. Uh, because there are, these modifications are least explored, and I'm always telling that these modifications at the five prime and it's, uh, are uh, playing some kind of role of, of uh, knots. So just imagine that you have fill, and if you make a knot at the end, it will be more stable. And this is what probably RNA caps are doing, even though this is not the answer to a question why there are so many. And I, will, I would like to show you today that there are really many types of RNA caps. From 70s, we know that there are typical caps in eukaryotes, so higher organisms like we are or yeast. There are cap 0, cap 1, cap 2. The structure is easy. You have RNA, uh, there is a triphosphate, and then there is this knot, oppositely uh, attached uh, guanine, which is methylated, and this is cap. Zero, then if it's methylated even on, on the other side, then it's cap one, and then it's cap two if it's methylated even farther. The role of cap one and cap two are essential for mRNA. This coding RNA, which I explained to you, it's, it's bearing the informa information about the gene and how the uh, protein should look like, because this simple small modification is uh, regulating nuclear transport. This is the signal that the RNA should go from the, uh, from the nucleus to cytosol. Uh, this is the, the, the signal uh, which is uh, triggering the translation. Without it, there is almost no translation, even there are some exceptions, but this is essential for the translation, so the, for the production of the proteins. And CAP0 is somehow unfinished, CAP1 and CAP2, and it seems that uh, it's essential in innate uh, immunity response, that the cells are able to recognize CAP0 and uh, tell, okay, there is a virus. Because viruses are somehow trying to, 
to pretend uh, that they are uh, at home, but they are not. And some of them do not have all the modifications uh, which are natural for our, uh, our own RNA. And in such a case, if they have only cap zero, then the cell can fight with it. So this was known from 70s, and uh, it was believed that the RNA caps are typical just for higher organisms, that the bacteria don't have any, any uh, type of such molecules on, on the five prime end of RNA. But this was changed in 2009 when two new structures were discovered as part of RNA, and it's NAD and coenzyme A, and they were discovered by LCMS. So the technique, which is actually taking RNA and chopping it into particle building blocks. And there, uh, authors saw that there are NAD and, and coenzyme A. And NAD and coenzyme A are actually protein cofactors. So that's why biologists were uh, actually very skeptical about this finding. And they thought, OK, this is nonsense. They simply uh, purified it as, a, as a, or it was not well purified. This is just contamination. This is not part of the RNA. But if we, as a chemist, look at it, we were not surprised at all. Because actually, NAD and coenzyme A, both uh, protein cofactors, are having structure of RNA. So these are actually RNA molecule. So probably the relics from the RNA world, I would say. But as I mentioned, these molecules were discovered by MS. So we didn't know anything on what types of RNA these caps are attached, uh, what uh, is the structure of these RNAs, how they are getting inside, how they are degraded. So we started to work on it, and I actually started as a postdoc in Heidelberg. And we discovered a special enzyme, which is called ADP ribosyl cyclase, which can actually take NAD RNA and convert it into, uh, I don't know whether it's, yeah, I cannot show it, but it can convert it to a, a molecule with a triple bond. Uh, why triple bond? Because it's biorthogonal, you will not find triple bond in the nature. And then with a the triple bond, we can do special caprylic catalyzed reaction. We can attach biotin. So it means that only those NAD uh, RNAs are having now biotin, and we ca can capture it selectively, only these RNAs, and wash out everything else, and then prepare the library for the sequencing. And this is the method, this is the trick, how we were able to find what types of RNA are having NAD. And we found it in E. coli on, like, I would say, two basic classes on small RNAs and some short fragments of mRNAs. <clears throat> what does it mean? That it's mainly on RNAs which are not bringing the information about the gene. So this is not the coding RNA, where we see it. And here I will not go into the details, but we were wondering what these uh, uh, caps are doing. I will not comment it here. I will show it here. We presume that actually they are, again, protecting RNA from the degradation as cap, cap 1 and cap 2 in eukaryotes. And we actually found enzymes which can cleave selectively the RNA. Uh, and we, we proposed, uh, sorry, we proposed mechanisms how the cell, how E. coli can somehow deal with the RNA, with the information actually. So if the RNA or if the information is encoded in RNA with monophosphate, such a RNA is immediately degraded. If the information is encoded in RNA with triphosphate, it needs to express first one enzyme called RPPH to cleave it, uh, to cleave it into form of monophosphates, and then it's degraded. And if it's in RNA with NAD, then there must be another special enzyme, NUTC, which will cleave it uh, into form of monophosphate, and then it will be degraded. So this was the first work which was showing that actually E. coli has cap as eukaryotes, that bacteria are having such caps, and that they can somehow uh, deal with the information. They can decide what information is essential in what moment. Okay, this was 2014-15, and where we are right now, do we understand better? So for, for now, I wanted to say that uh, we know that uh, NAD is in all types of organisms, but I forgot we do not know about parasites. There we are, we are not sure. We know it's in human cells, we know that it's in plants, uh, we know it's uh, in archaea. We know that it's actually RNA polymerase, who is taking free NAD, incorporating it into RNA. We know some enzymes which are cleaving it, 
but we still do not understand the function. From our experiments, I can tell you that NAD on mRNA, on this coding RNA, will not lead to translation. So, at least under normal conditions. So this is not the role of NAD. There must be another role. And with my students, we decided to look at it from the other point of view. Uh, we decided to take viruses as model systems. And we had a look on HIV because HIV is super interesting because it's causing intracellular pellagra. This is the disease uh, which is caused by deficiency of vitamin B3, niacin. And niacin is direct precursor of NAD. So if there is very low concentration of niacin, there is also very low concentration of NAD. And then we thought that maybe HIV can help us to understand the role of NAD, RNA. And uh, this disease, this uh, intra or this pellagra, is uh, known by symptoms like dermatitis, dementia, diarrhea, even death. Nowadays, it's known only in the developing world uh, for in malnutrition uh, people. Uh, previously, it was described in Spain. It's known from gulags and so on. And already in around 1999. Niacin was suggested as a preven preventive uh, uh, AIDS uh, drug because uh, it inhibits uh, HIV infection. So what does it mean? HIV doesn't like NAD. Doesn't, and, and what role it will have, uh, or like a, will NAD RNA play any role in this aspect? This was our question. How it's happening? How it's happening causing the depletion of NAD? I think there are like a three main, or I found in literature, three main reasons. Uh, the activation of CD38, activation of certains, but most probably and the main cause is activation of PARPs. Uh, so PARPs are activated by oxidative stress because of HIV infection. This heavily consumes NAD. This triggers the novoneosine synthesis. And this is causing tryptophan oxidation, which is essential for the niacin synthesis. And this is secondary, also causing immunosuppression. So this is also how HIV is dealing with it. So we were asking whether also in our uh, cellular model, we can see that whether there is less NAD if we infect cells with HIV. And indeed, we found that four times there is less of NAD. So will this drop influence RNA NAD capping? And indeed, we saw a huge drop in NAD RNA capping. So then we were asking, and what types of RNA are losing the NAD? Do they play any role in HIV infection? So we applied this capping method I described before, and we found out that there are mainly these, I would say, regulatory small RNA, which are not coding anything influenced by this, and they are losing NAD. And they are from the family of SNO, SNRNA. These are like processing RNAs, uh, which are uh, doing maturation of ribosomal RNA, of this coding RNA, and so on. And from all these, we were trying to find the connection with them and HIV. And there was only one, which seems really particular, and it's U1. It's a U1 SNRNA, which actually binds, beside many other roles it has, it binds to, uh, to the pre-mRNA of HIV, and by binding, it's attracting other proteins, and it's securing translocation of the mRNA of HIV into the cytosol, and securing HIV to have all the essential proteins it needs. And if there is any single mutation in this 5' region, then there is no HIV replication. So what we did, we uh, thought that maybe NAD, maybe the caps can play a role in binding of RNA to each other. And we prepared model RNA like, and we found out that actually this is the case, that the NAD is really destabilizing the complex of NAD uh, of U1 and, and HIV pre-mRNA. Uh, of course, any any effect we would observe, uh, people will tell us, okay, but it's just free NAD which is causing the effect. How you can know that it's because it's part of the RNA? So we decided we should somehow manipulate with NAD RNA. We should somehow get rid of it. So, and we look at the decapping enzyme, the enzyme which are cleaving NAD from the RNA so that we would get RNA without NAD and we would know what's happening. 
And there are actually two enzymes which are cleaving it. One, it's new T12, but it's cleaving also free NAD. So this is not the enzyme of our interest because it would also impact uh, the, the total pool of NAD. But there is also DXO, which is cleaving NAD from the RNA. So we tried to, uh, we, we checked whether it's cleaving NAD on U1, indeed it was, and then we did overexpression. So in cells, we increased the concentration of this enzyme. And we found out that actually the uh, NAD RNA really dropped uh, heavily, and we found that the inf infectivity increased. So this is a proof that actually not only the pool of NAD, but the pool of NAD RNA is influencing the HIV infection, that it's really essential for it. We were also trying to do the knockdown, so it means to uh, uh, completely switch off the decupping enzyme. But uh, obviously you can see that the, we did not uh, reach the effect, and it seems that the decupping enzymes are so essential that if you switch one, there will be other uh, overexpressed within the cell to take over the function. And so because our knockdown didn't work, so it means that we are not able to uh, increase the NAD RNA just by, by this enzyme. So what we did, we added nicotine amide, which leads to increasing NAD concentration, and we also reached higher NAD RNA concentration, and this is uh, the, the, the case for healthy cells, cells which were infected with HIV. And we were looking at this U1 molecule. And you can see that in a wild tab, there are approximately 7% of U1 having NAD. And uh, when we add nicotinamide, it's increasing to 9. Uh, there is always increase when we add nicotinamide. And here, I think we are getting to some kind of new phenomenon, which we are now observing or on, on what level of science we are right now. Because previously thought, OK, there is this some kind of cap and it's there from 100%. So it was zero or one, it's there or it's not there. And here you can see we have seven person, it's not much, you know, but still it has probably the biological function. So we are not, we are getting to the, like a very tiny, tiny, small changes and uh, which are leading to changes in equilibrium within the cell, even on the level of RNA. And I think this can influence the total metabolism and total behavior in the cell and maybe can explain some like long-term diseases. Okay, so just like make it clearer. So we increase nicotinamide, we increase NAD RNA, we decrease HIV infectivity, we increase DXO enzyme, which is cleaving NAD from RNA, uh, so it means there won't be so much NAD RNA, we are increasing infectivity. And here is just like briefly and simplified that under normal production of, uh, uh, or normal production of DXO, th th there is infection, it's happening, it's normal, but if we manage to deplete the NAD RNA within the cell by overexpression of DXO, what will happen? HIV is much more happy and there is much higher production of, of uh, HIV. So we believe that this could be kind of model how to understand NAD uh, RNA or NAD capping role. So we know that NAD RNA capping is undesirable for HIV infection. NAD cap on U1 as an RNA destabilizes its binding to HIV prime RNA, and it could be in general role for all the caps everywhere. And what we want to do, we want to study whether it's really the case, whether the, these caps are facilitating deteriorating binding to target RNA. And that probably an AD RNA capping plays some role in viral and host mRNA splicing, but I was not talking about it today. Uh, now I will get to second part of my talk, uh, which was done by two very talented postdoc. And when I established my lab, uh, we uh, realized that maybe NAD is not the only uh, cap, uh, because I already mentioned coenzyme A, there are these eukaryotic ones, so are there even other? And we noticed in 2016 that all the known caps in the time are cleaved by nudix enzymes. And these nudix enzymes are super interesting because they are simply everywhere. And we humans have, for example, 24 of them. And some of them are essential in, in cancer development. So it's really important to understand their role. 
What we still do not understand, because at the beginning we thought that they have some kind of house cleaning function, they are just cleaving what, what they find and it's not uh, essential for the cell. But they have quite wide uh, range of, uh, they are cleaving wide range of organic pyrophosphates, some of them penta inositol phosphate, uh, coenzyme A, ADP ribose, some are decapping, and some of them cleave these dinoclosite polyphosphates. And dinoclosite polyphosphates are molecules which are known more than 50 years. We know that they are in all types of cells, in human cells, in bacteria. And as you can see, they have very similar structure to this canonical cap one or, or zero or two I was showing at the beginning. So we have actually in our cells in free form molecules which are very similar. So our, and, and we know uh, that they are biosynthesized by tRNA synthetases. We know how they are biodegraded. We know that their concentration increases under the stress. That's why they are often called alarmons, because they are somehow connected with the stress. And, but we do not understand their, uh, their uh, mechanisms of uh, function. I'm always saying just, um, Remember when the morning you hear the alarm, this is your ear, what is recognizing it here. Here we have cells which are stressed, there are molecules formed, but we do not know what is the ear. So we are now trying to understand what, the, what these molecules are doing, what is recognizing, what is the ear in the cell. And their concentration can be pretty high. So we tried to take them and give them to RNA polymerase. Can RNA polymerase build from them the RNA? Yes, it can. It can. They are very good substrate, and they can serve as a, as a, as a cap, actually, as an AD. Uh, then we were asking, do we know some enzymes which can cleave them? Yes, there is uh, actually a table from 2006 which was summarizing all the 13 nutix enzymes from E. coli, and there was one particle one which was called Nut H, which uh, was known to cleave free uh, AP4A, AP5A, AP6A. So we said, okay, what if this enzyme is cleaving it from the RNA? I will skip this. And indeed, this enzyme was cleaving it very well. Then we found another enzyme which can cleave it, APAH. By the way, APAH is also in, a, in, a, uh, in parasites known. This is the enzyme which is known to um, uh, be essential for the, for the stress resistance, actually. And it was known to cleave free AP4A. We tested it, and it was cleaving AP4A from the RNA. So it's decapping enzyme. It has something to do with the RNA as well. OK, I told you, they are in, in cell, in a free form. RNA polymerase can take them and build the RNA. We know the enzyme which can cleave it. But do they exist in vivo? So for this, we took E. coli. We harvested from the two stages of growth. Uh, and one was exponential phase, one was late stationary phase. We isolated the RNA, uh, we tried to wash out everything, what was like a f from small molecules to have just pure RNA, and then we performed MS analysis, so mass spectrometry. So we took the RNA, we chopped it, and then indeed we found, we found actually nine new molecules there. So it really exists, and some of these molecules were also methylated, like I was explaining at the beginning from, for the eukaryotic world. In bacteria, there are also such caps which are also methylated. Uh, we were able to find out the position of methylations. They are very similar to what we know from the human world or our eukaryotic world. So for example, M7GP4G methoxy, M6A, AP3A, so very typical modifications. And we just by naked eye, we were able to see that uh, there is a higher amount of them in a late stationary phase. So it means you stress the cells, they are not happy, they are not having enough building blocks, nutrition, and they are having more RNA, which is kept. This is definitely happening. So we were injecting exactly the same amount of the RNA from the exponential, so happy phase and, and, and a, let's say, set phase of, of the cell growth. And you can see that there is like a twice more of these caps. So, uh, what is the role of these caps? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big question and we are going to study it in future. But at least we were asking and what these methylations are doing there. And first thing which came to our mind was actually that the, we know that if the caps are not methylated, there are two enzymes which are cleaving it. What this enzyme will be doing if the metal is there? Will they still cleave it? Could it be protection from the, from the cleavage? And Indeed, uh, to make long story short, we observed that one of these enzymes, APH, is not able to cleave methylated caps. And then we looked at the expression profile of these uh, enzymes, 
and it started to make sense. We realized that probably under the normal phase of growth in bacteria, uh, there are various types of caps you can imagine, including NAD and so on. And there is RPPH or other enzymes which can cleave it, and then uh, nucleases can degrade it. So the cell can very flexibly react to what's happening in its environment, whether it needs that protein or another protein or other enzymes. If it doesn't need it, it expresses the degradation enzymes and it cleaves the RNA. But the situation changes under some kind of stress, uh, for example, under starvation. Suddenly, there are no building blocks for making new macromolecules, like RNA. But the cell needs these RNA. What it does, it activates for us still unknown metal transferases, which are methylate these caps and protect them from the cleavage by RPPH, and then the nucleases cannot degrade it. Cells doesn't have flexible uh, flexibility to react to the environment, but it has at least something. It can keep it. And then colleagues ask me, but what will happen? You know, cells will survive the stress and then they want to, they want to live further. You know, it would accumulate there. It wouldn't. Because in the moment the cell goes to back normal, then there is this APAH. This is the role of APAH based on an expression profile. This is activated, this is degraded, this methylated molecules, methylated RNAs, and they can be degraded and the cell can again build new RNAs which are essential and necessary for the new phase of growth. So, with this, just like a basic general conclusion or take home message, uh, RNAs are heavily modified at the five prime end. This is the, another layer of information which the RNA is bringing or having. Uh, that it's depending on the, on the environment. This is not like this. This is really changing within the life of the cell, of, um, not only of bacteria, but also of eukaryotic cells. Uh, we are sure that they play a role in a pathogenicity of viruses and bacteria, and this is maybe the main purpose where we are going. You know, If we understand these processes, maybe we will be able to, to come up with a new types of treatments and so on. Uh, we think that the basic role is that they they are not translated, but they are somehow pairing and blocking or uh, allowing the translocation and so on. This is their role of these caps. And that the general role of these caps is uh, not known and should be explored in bacteria and eukaryotes. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, thank uh, founding agencies, uh, my wonderful team for their work, collaborators, and you for your kind attention. And I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you very much, Anka, for this nice talk and introduction to the whole field of capping RNA. Questions, comments? Yula. Uh, how many of those 170 modifications your lab is able to, uh, to diagnose, to recognize? Uh, not no, not all, because I think you mainly need uh, the, I was talking about it with Zdeněk, uh, you need uh, the uh, standards, you know, and if you do not have them, not all of them are uh, available commercially, you have to prepare them, so you need like a good synthetic chemist who will make them. So, yeah, some of them we can make by ourselves, some of them we can buy. But uh, if you're going into the like, more complex modifications like in tRNA, we, we, are, we do not have them. So without standards, it's difficult to detect. But, so what would be still the answer? Uh, how many out of those 170 you can detect? We are not looking to all of them, actually. So I cannot, you know, like M6A, M5C, M1A, pseudouridine, these all we can, this classical one, treonyl uh, A, we can detect. Uh, it's all, all about, you know, you focus on it and then you develop the technique. It's not that you put RNA into the MS and you just like, a, you try to, to see it. It's not so easy and, and so simple. So, but if we want, we, we have to develop the technique. We are able to do it. We are able to detect it. Uh -huh. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. We have more questions? Please. The second type of the cap you are talking about bacteria. Do you know what type of RNAs are bound by that cap? Because you said that the RNAs are important for the stress response, but are they coding or they are, if they are still non-coding RNAs? Uh, what we, we do not know. We are now developing the techniques. As I developed for NAD, 
So this is the only uh, thing which brings you the final answer. Because like this, you are able to say, okay, this is fragment of tRNA, this is regulatory RNA, this is mRNA. What's important to say in bacteria, uh, it's cap-independent translation. So it should, does not matter, you know, what is really on the cap, because a ribosome is binding into like a, per, a side which is, uh, which is intended for that. It's not like in uh, eukaryotes where it's like a really uh, recognized through the cap. So I think they do not play direct role in the translation. It was shown already for NAD actually. Uh, but um, they may play a role for the stabilization, localization and so on.